Join me tonight on Twitch at 11.30 p.m. Eastern at the conclusion of Sunday Night Football, where we'll talk about everything from this week in the NFL season. Plus, I'll have my Jaguars recap on their game against the Cowboys. Link to join below. And now, on with our feature presentation. December 15, 1968. It's the Philadelphia Eagles against the Minnesota Vikings in the regular season finale. What looked on paper like just another game would live on in NFL history more than half a century later as one of the most infamous moments in the history not just of the Eagles franchise, but in the history of Philadelphia sports. Sure, the Vikings won this game 24-17, but no one cares about that. And no one remembers that. What they remember is what happened at halftime. I'm not going to dive into the specifics and dive too much into the weeds of this, simply because it's been talked about at length, and there are many videos and documentaries on it already. But long story short, the Eagles picked a fan to dress up as Santa Claus and come onto the field for the halftime show. The rest is history. Because what followed was fans protesting what had been a horrible season where they had a 2-11 record entering and had won their last two games, meaning that they couldn't get the number one pick and get the coveted O.J. Simpson in the NFL draft, and protesting an absolutely horrible, cheap-looking Santa costume, pelting Santa with hundreds of snowballs. It's been talked about over and over again. Eagles fans booed Santa Claus. Eagles fans are classless because of what they did to this poor guy in a Santa suit. I'm not going to dive into the arguments there, because people have very strong opinions on this all this time later, and depending on who you ask, saying this about Eagles fans could be construed as untrue, or misleading, or a cheap shot, or lacking context, or completely accurate and a microcosm of that fan base. Everyone's got a different opinion. However, it is odd that of all the things that have happened in Eagles history involving fan behavior, that this is the one that survived, and this is the one that people remember. If the average NFL fan knows just three things about the 1968 season, it's the Heidi game, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, Joe Namath's guarantee and the Jets' subsequent win at Super Bowl III over the heavily favored Baltimore Colts, which you can also learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, and Eagles fans pelting Santa with snowballs. Maybe it's because of the Christmas imagery and the dichotomy of a man trying to bring joy and who symbolizes goodness being completely pelted by angry and somewhat drunk fans. Maybe it's because it was caught on camera, whereas the incident we're going to talk about in this video today, unfortunately, was not. All I'm saying is that if you want an incident involving Eagles fans being rowdy, unruly, and dangerous in their team's home regular season finale, against a team that currently plays in the NFC North, this Santa incident doesn't even scratch the surface. Because four years later, in 1972, Eagles fans did something absolutely crazy that has been somewhat forgotten throughout NFL history, but deserves to be remembered, because it truly is insane. We're talking about fans storming the field. We're talking about trash being dumped onto the field. And we're even talking about fans getting into the Eagles locker room to protest and fight. That's how bad it got. Imagine fans entering the playing field and storming the locker room to voice their displeasure and how unsafe that could potentially get. And yet, that is exactly what happened as the Eagles ended their home slate of games for the 1972 season. Because this is the story behind one of the craziest fan incidents in the history of Veterans Stadium and in the over 90 year history of the Philadelphia Eagles franchise. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, we need some context to understand what happened during the actual game, as well as how Philly's season was going, because it will give us a great understanding as to why Philly fans were so upset with just about everything that transpired on this day. It's December 10th, 1972. It's week 13 of the NFL season, and we have one of the biggest regular season games in the history of the NFL between the Chicago Bears and the Philadelphia Eagles. Both teams were fighting for their playoff lives in this must-win game, as the winner controlled their own destiny if everyone else in the conference had to fold because they got drafted to go to Vietnam. 
Seriously, this game could not have been less important except for pride and draft positioning. This game meant nothing. These were two of the worst teams in football, with a 3-8-1 Bears team taking on a 2-9-1 Eagles team. And as it pertained to the Eagles, this was their last home game of the season. And man, could the season not come to an end soon enough. I've talked about just how bad the 1972 Eagles were, and how dysfunctional they were in a previous video of mine. So if you want to learn more about them and their futility, click the card in the upper right corner. The season got off to a rough start for them, as they dropped each of their first five games. And things did not get any better leading up to this point, as they were entering this game against Chicago on a three-game losing streak. They had what was hands down the worst offense in football, having scored just 110 points through 12 games, coming out to an average of about 9 points per game. That was it. For some perspective on how bad that was, not only was it 34 points worse than the next worst team in football, which was the Houston Oilers at 144, but if the Miami Dolphins played their first five games that season, and then just decided to forfeit every game from that point on, they still would have had more points scored on the season than the Eagles had by this point. When you combine that with an atrocious defense that had allowed 307 points, or 26 points per game, which was the second worst total in the NFC, only ahead of the New Orleans Saints, and a team that had a point differential of minus 197, which was the worst in the NFC, and the second worst in the NFL, only ahead of the New England Patriots at minus 237, it's no surprise that this Eagles team absolutely stunk, and was in serious consideration for being the worst Eagles team of all time. Worse than 1968. Seriously, outside of wide receiver Harold Jackson, who led the league in receiving yards that season, and Bill Bradley, who led the league with nine interceptions, there were zero redeeming qualities about this team. They hadn't won a game at home yet, so at least if they won this one, they could give their fans at least one win this year, so their season tickets weren't a complete waste. So how do the really bad Eagles perform against a really bad Bears team? Not well. Not well at all. If I told you that the Bears completed one pass all day, that quarterback Bobby Douglas went 1-for-9 with no touchdowns, an interception, and a passer rating of 7.9, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play, and that the Eagles forced four turnovers, you would think, without a shadow of a doubt, that the Eagles won the scheme, right? You think there's no way whatsoever that this box score would lend itself to a loss. However, not only did it lead to a loss, but it led to a loss by multiple possessions. As somehow, the Eagles lost this game 21-12, getting outscored 14-0 in the second half. Philly got nothing going on the ground, averaging just 3.3 yards per carry. Philly also turned it over four times, and their offensive line was atrocious in pass protection, as they allowed six sacks. And regardless of who was back there at quarterback, whether it was John Reeves, Rick Arrington, or Pete Lisk, they could not move the ball through the air. All three quarterbacks threw an interception, combined to complete 40% of their passes, and combined as a team for a passer rating of 23.8. They played awful football, just as they had for the entire season. And at no point in the game did they have a play that went for more than 20 yards. If you're watching this, and you were at that game, or you had season tickets to the Eagles in 1972, from the bottom of my heart, my condolences. However, there was nothing too remarkable about this game from an on-the-field perspective. It's one of the thousands upon thousands of games that was played in NFL history, and has since been largely forgotten, and it's not hard to see why. It was an unremarkable, sloppy game between two of the worst teams in football, that wound up meaning absolutely nothing. But this game deserves to be remembered because of what happened afterwards, when the cameras were shut off and the fans went wild, and not in a good way. Now the fans were rowdy and restless throughout the entire game, as was to be expected, seeing as this was the final home game of an awful season, and they wanted a ton of changes. They were chanting throughout the entire game, that they wanted Rick Arrington to be put into the game at quarterback, 
with the chants being so loud that after the game, their head coach even admitted to hearing the fans and their cries. Fans protested by not showing up. Over 15,000 fans that bought tickets decided to stay home and not attend the game. And signs throughout the stadium show that Eagles fans were fed up. One sign read, Eagles number one and number two draft choices for 1973. New owner and new GM. While another sign read, Toes, you got what you paid for. We didn't. Toes refers to Leonard Toes, the owner of the Eagles, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But so far, this was just typical angry fan behavior. Heck, even the handful of fans who stormed the field, while bizarre, wasn't anything unusual or dangerous. We've seen worse. Amazingly enough, there actually is footage of one of these fans storming incidents during the game. One fan stormed the field in the fourth quarter and made it all the way to the end zone before three security guards tackled him to the ground. Another fan, shortly after, stormed the field and got on for a bit, with one person in the press box quipping, somebody ought to tell the cops about zone coverage. These guys are still playing man-to-man. -man. But after the game, it wasn't quite as playful or as funny. Because immediately when the game ended, a bunch of fans stormed the field, angry about their team's performance and their team's terrible season, especially at home. And I'm not talking about one or two fans. I'm not talking about 10 or 20 fans. Heck, I'm not even talking about 100 fans. I'm talking about over a thousand fans. Over 1,000 fans stormed the field in a non-joyous field storming. This was a we want to fight and we want to protest kind of field storming. Obviously, security couldn't catch them all. They were somewhat helpless against one fan. So against a thousand, it was never a contest. However, one fan in particular drew attention when somehow he got a bunch of trash bags and proceeded to empty them and dump them onto the field. I think the metaphor is pretty obvious there. Now how he got the trash bags and all the trash, I have no clue, because I genuinely have no idea how one goes about that without wrestling one of the janitors for them. But this fan dumped bags upon bags upon bags of trash onto the veteran stadium field. While security was helpless against most of the fans, they were able to get that fan and they escorted him out of the stadium. We don't know who that fan was, what his identity was, or the exact reason why they did it. All we know is that it was a guy. But you know how mob rule works. At this point, it was the fans against everyone else, especially security. And when the fans saw Trash Guy getting escorted out of the stadium for his unruly behavior, some fans took it upon themselves to get revenge and to take matters into their own hands. And that's when about 40 or so fans decided to go into the tunnel and storm the Eagles locker room. Now outside of the locker room, not only did you have the team and the coaching staff, and not only did you have media members, but you had a bunch of angry, unruly fans who were looking to fight and voice their displeasure. While none of the players were hurt in all of this or got involved, which is obviously a very good thing, reports indicated that there was a ton of shoving that occurred. So this got pretty violent. There were quite a few fights. The crowd eventually dispersed, and security eventually got control of the situation way too late. But the damage was already done. Thousands of fans storming the field in protest, attacking security, dumping bags of trash onto the field, and then going into the locker room to fight more security guards and go face to face with the players. Honestly, I'm not sure it gets a whole lot crazier than that. Everything about this season for the 1972 Eagles was terrible, especially the on-field product, which was an abomination in more ways than one. And when it came to the home slate, I think it's safe to say that the season ended just about as bad and just as ugly as it started. The game was bad. The post-game was bad. Quite literally, everything about this game was bad and was a microcosm of the 1972 Eagles season. Because when the Eagles ended their home slate against the Bears, things got very, 
very out of control. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.